whisper thoughts of goodwill every morning, every evening. Making it our resolve that we want to act in a way that's conducive to everybody's true happiness. If there's anybody out there who's suffering that we can help, we'd be happy to help. Anyone who's already happy or acting on the causes of happiness, we're happy for them. We don't resent them. We're not jealous. But then there's also that reflection on equanimity. All beings are the owners of their actions. This is our reality check. Because we realize that the suffering in the world is just too much for us to go out and, and solve. There's limits on our own time and our energy. And we have no control over the people. After all, people are going to be happy, they're going to suffer based on their actions. And even in a small group of people, you can't get everybody to agree on what the path to happiness is going to be. Or even if they do agree, you can't get everybody to practice the way you think they should practice. The world is going to go its way. And on the one hand, we can make that a source of suffering, or we can decide that we have to accept that fact and do what we can. After all, the Buddha couldn't teach everybody. There are lots of people who listened to him and didn't agree, went off their own ways. But he did something really remarkable instead of letting that get him down or depressed. He realized that he could be a good example, that this is how you find true happiness. If other people followed the example, that was fine. He'd be happy to explain how to do it, talk about the difficulties that he'd encountered and how he'd overcome them, give people encouragement. There's one story where Dissa, who was a distant relative of the Buddha's, ordained as a monk and his practice wasn't going anywhere. He went to see the Buddha, and the Buddha gave him encouragement. He said, look, I'm here. You've got a Buddha right here. Take advantage of that. We don't have the Buddha right here, but we do have his teachings. And so when you think of all the suffering out in the world, the two appropriate responses are one sangwega. The realization that the things that people are doing to cause suffering, you've been doing. And if you don't get your act together, you're going to be contributing more and more to the suffering. We've got the opportunity now to practice the Dharma. If we don't take this opportunity, then when we come back the next time, we may forget all about this. And who knows how long it's going to take to find our way back to the Dharma. But when you see that there are people in the world who have been practicing, you can read about the Ajans. Be inspired by their example. You realize, well, you could be an example too. And that's a real gift to the world. It's like a street light. The post just stands there, the light's there. It doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't do anything, but it casts light. And so your example can be a light to the world. So as we're practicing here, we're not just saving our own hides and forgetting about the world, turning our back on them. We're doing something really important. I've heard people complain that Buddhism should get its act together. We should have charitable foundations. We should go out and actively work on this and work on that. Well, there are lots of other people out there doing that. How many people are practicing the way to nirvana? This is a very small number. And that's actually a gift to the world. In my own case, when going to Thailand, I'd been looking for a meditation teacher for years, and had pretty much given up hope of finding a good one. Then met a John Fu, and that changed everything. Just one person can have that kind of an effect.
So given that the world has swept away and it's a slave to craving, and it's not all that easy to get people to stop their craving, especially if your desire for them to listen to you to stop their craving is based on your own craving. Things just keep going around and around and around in a whirlpool. But if you can do your practice, it really is a gift. And John Sawat used to say that we're here not to get other people, we're here to get ourselves. In other words, to practice so that we can find release. And he said if other people want to join us, they like what we're doing, we welcome them. But we're not going to go out of our way to try to draw people in. That's an attitude you can live with. You don't have to be concerned about how many people out there are going to follow your example, or how many people in the world are going to be able to overcome their suffering. There's that story about the man who asked the Buddha, this path that you're teaching, will the whole world eventually go this way, or half the world, or a third? And the Buddha didn't answer. Ananda, who was sitting by, got concerned that the man would think poorly of the Buddha, and here was an important question, and he didn't answer it. So Nanda took him aside and said, it's like a frontier fortress, and the gatekeeper walks around the fortress and doesn't find a hole in the wall even big enough for a cat to slip through. Now, he doesn't know how many people are going to come into the fortress, but he does know that anybody who's going to come in or out of the fortress has to do it through the one gate. It's the same with the Buddha's knowledge. He doesn't know how many people are going to find release, but he does know whoever's going to do it has to do it through this path. Right conduct, establishing mindfulness, developing the factors for awakening. And see, here we are beneficiaries of the Buddha's teachings. This is what he wants us to do. Go into the fortress. And this is the path. So this is how we show our gratitude for the teaching. And it's how we keep it alive. It's through the fact that there are people who really are serious about practicing. This is what inspires other people to be serious about practicing. Otherwise, you look around and a lot of the examples you see of the human race are not all that inspiring. And it can get very discouraging. And you may wonder, why should you put out extra effort? But then you realize that the fact that they're, most of the people are not practicing doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you're suffering. You've got something you can do about the suffering. You can say, oh, this person, this one person will make a difference. Because after all, when you come down to it, who are you you're responsible for? Again, as John Sweat said, each of us has one person, the one person whose thoughts, words, and deeds that we can have some control over, in other words, ourselves. When you get that one person, you've taken care of your responsibility. As for the good effects that come from that, they spread out like ripples in a pond. And how many people will be affected by the ripples or will want to be affected by the ripples? You have no control. Even the Buddha didn't have control over that issue. But he did make sure that what he was responsible for, he did as well as he could. And that's what gives us inspiration.